Hello, everyone, and welcome to our um, safety training this morning with the uh, Strait Area Chamber of Commerce. My name is Susan Fox, and I'm the Acting Executive Director for the Chamber. As you can see, I'm working from home. Um, Bob's doing some uh, construction in the building. It's going to look awesome when he's done. So they're putting new windows in our offices right now. So uh, I'm still at home, but uh, we'll be making the move in shortly, as everybody else will be moving back to work also. So um, we have you here today for our um, safety training with um, Don Martel and uh, Marc-Andre Lavoie, and we're going to provide you with some details on occupational health and safety and the legislation and how it applies during COVID-19. The roles and responsibilities for employers uh, and give you some examples for innovative ways to address the challenges in your workplace, leave you with a greater understanding of how the COVID-19 can be spread and be better prepared to act um, in a preventative way. So I'm going to ask Jeremy, um, he's the communications coordinator, Jeremy Martel from the Cape Breton Partnership to uh, give us a little run through on how this is going to work technically. Jeremy. Thank you very much, Susan. Can you hear me okay there? Yep. Fantastic. Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. And thank you for Don and Marc-Andre Lavoie for uh, joining us today uh, to present on uh, some topics regarding reopening and reactivating safely uh, as we move into tomorrow and beyond. Today we're using uh, the Zoom webinar platform to host this webinar. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, we are going to hold them to the end of the presentation, but you can feel free to ask a question whenever you'd like. To do so, you can use the Q&A tool that's at the bottom of the screen. You'll see two speech bubbles in the words Q&A. If you click on that, you can type in your question whenever you'd like. Um, we would ask, if possible, if you can direct your question to whichever presenter um, that you would like to answer the question. If not, we'll pick for you. Uh, if you have any technical difficulties or have any questions uh, throughout about uh, this presentation or others um, in terms of how it's working or you're having an issue hearing or seeing or anything, please use the chat function down below as well. That'll go to us and we'll keep an eye and try to help you out throughout the presentation. I'll also put my phone number and email in the chat box so that if you have any questions or you're receiving any issues that you can get a hold of me that way as well. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I'll be in the background as well, but Susan, I'll hand it back over to you. Enjoy everyone. Thanks, Jeremy, appreciate it. So I'd like to um, introduce you to our presenters. Uh, Don Martel and Marc-Andre Lavoie have uh, graciously agreed to come and uh, help us out with this today and explain and help guide us through the uh, safety measures that we'll need to take uh, action on going forward. So Don Martel is a Canadian registered safety professional and the owner operator of Strait Area Safety Services. He began his career in the trades, particularly the mechanical field as a journeyman automotive technician, a bus and transport technician and a master emergency vehicle technician where he developed a passion for public safety. Don's regulatory and public safety experience includes 10 years in occupational health and safety officer with the Nova Scotia Department of Labor and Advanced Education, six years as a Nova Scotia Provincial Fleet and Facility Inspector for the Emergency Health Services, and nine years as a Nova Scotia Provincial Motor Vehicle Inspection Officer. Don also owned and operated professional automotive mechanical accident investigations completing mechanical investigations on vehicles involved in fatal accidents for the RCMP and appearing in prosecution cases as an expert witness on behalf of the Crown Prosecutor's Office. Today, Don consults for employers in all industries to assist them in achieving compliance and regulatory responsibilities in relation to Nova Scotia's Occupational Health and Safety Act. Um, Marc-Andre Lavoir is our second presenter and uh, Marc is the leader founder of Risk Marker Incorporated. Marc-Andre is a recognized leader and manager in the domain of environment, health and safety. His main focus is on occupational hygiene and has been in the field of exposure science for more than 20 years. Marc-Andre possesses a master's degree in electrochemistry is a registered occupational hygienist and has also been an adjunct professor in the industry, industrial toxicology, industrial hygiene and workplace monitoring at both Quebec and McGill University. During the course of his career, Marc-Andre has worked in collaboration with occupational physicians, epidemiologists and toxicologists in multiple issues related to chemical exposure impact on the 
health of workers and the general public. He's currently an active member of the American Industri Industrial Hygiene Association um, with a leadership position in the Atlantic Province section. Thank you very much, Mark and Don, for uh, joining us today. And um, I'll uh, hand it over to you, Don, to uh, get things started. Thank you, Susan. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Yeah, I hear you perfect. Okay, so uh, Susan has introduced me, so there's uh, no need for any further introductions. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for, for taking in the webinar today and welcome. Uh, I'll get going with my presentation because we really only have about an hour here and uh, I know that Mark Albrecht's presentation is uh, really important. So uh, we'll get going and if there's any questions, we'll keep them till the end as uh, was mentioned earlier and we'll try to answer your questions. So here we go. I'll uh, talk to you about uh, a little bit about uh, regulatory uh, responsibilities today and uh, Dr. Strang's order and uh, what we can do to uh, deal with that as employers. So COVID-19, as we know, is one of the newest hazards for all workplaces. Uh, and while the virus is of a very serious nature, we still need to be mindful that it is a hazard. And in workplaces, uh, we need to use our hazard control process that we have at our workplace to uh, deal with COVID-19. It's here and it's uh, here to stay probably and it's not going away anytime soon. So uh, we need to learn to deal with that. So for the legislation part, uh, the provincial legislation and the occupational high and safety regulations, uh, some of the stuff that we need to be mindful of is in section 13 of the act, the general duty clause is what it's called, but it's one of the most important clauses uh, in the regulation uh, and here's what it states. Every employer shall take every precaution that is reasonable in the circumstances to ensure the health and safety of persons at or near the workplace. And remember that's persons, not only your employees, but anyone that visits or comes to your workplace. Uh, to provide information, instruction, and training and supervision in facilities, uh, as such as are necessary to uh, ensure the health and safety of your employees. Ensure that the employees, and particularly supervisors, are uh, uh, made familiar with any health and safety hazards that might that they, mean, they might uh, meet at the workplace. Ensure that employees are made familiar with all the, the proper use of all devices and equipment and PPE or any clothing that may be required. John, can you continue to uh, share your presentation as well? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was sharing it. Can we see it now? Yes, we can. Okay. Sorry about that. And uh, at the bottom, ensure that employees are made familiar with the proper use of all devices, equipment, and uh, clothing required for their protection. And of course, conduct the employer's undertaking so that employees or supervision are not exposed to health and safety hazards at the workplace. Every employer shall consult or cooperate with the Occupational Health and Safety Committee. Now, there's some workplaces I realize that don't have a committee, but if you don't have a committee, generally you're, you're required to have a safety representative. And uh, this is the uh, vehicle that's used for the employee's right to know. So you would share the information with either the committee or the representative who would then take this back to the employees. Uh, cooperate with any person performing duty imposed or uh, exercising a power conferred by the act. This would be an occupational health and safety officer, hygienist, engineer, investigator, any one of those who might visit your workplace for some reason or other. And uh, it is, uh, their powers in the act if you have to uh, uh, cooperate with them when they visit your workplace. So let's look at Dr. Strang's order uh, under Section 32 of the Health Protection Act. 
in the order that you find self-isolation uh, is the requirement of any person who has COVID-19 to remain separate from others uh, and in such places or under such conditions so as to prevent or limit the direct or indirect transmission of COVID-19. Uh, this is self-isolation. For self-quarantine, they define this as the requirement of any person who has been exposed uh, or may have been exposed to COVID-19. They have to self-quarantine. So if you note up above, the requirement is placed on the person, not the employer. All of the order Dr. Strang has out there is all about self-assessment by people, and it's for each person in the province. Now, the employer does have responsibilities under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, but as far as this order, it, it's directed at each person. So close contact is not defined in the order, but reading through the order and reading through the material that's been put out by the province is defined as a person who provided care for someone who tested positive for COVID-19, a person who had close physical contact with someone who tested positive for COVID-19, a person who lives with someone who has COVID-19 and is not practicing social distancing, and a person who's had direct contact with bodily fluid with someone who tested positive for COVID-19. Now you may say, how, how am I going to do that? Well, as it has been mentioned several times, uh, the virus is spread through droplets and it could be spread through sneezing, coughing, loud yelling or singing or anything like that. And it lands on materials or things or equipment and can be spread in that manner. So uh, everybody, there's nobody that's immune to this. It's, it can be spread through those bodily fluids. So we need to be mindful of that. So as far as the order in section three, uh, March 23rd is when it was uh, put out. And uh, if you reside in the province or you enter the province, uh, if you're traveling from outside the province, of course, you have to quarantine for third, uh, 14 days unless you've uh, been deemed an essential uh, service person by the government. And if so, then there's channels you have to follow and processes you have to follow in order to be deemed uh, an essential person and be exempted from that. So if you've been identified as a close contact, If you've been identified as a person diagnosed with COVID-19, or if you've been tested for COVID-19 and you're awaiting the results. Either way, you have to self-quarantine or self-isolate, uh, whatever the case might be, for those 14 days. So there are exempted essential workers, and they're only exempted if they're healthy. That's the important part here. But we need to remember that this, again, is self-assessing. Uh, there may be occasions where your neighbor or someone that knows you uh, may snitch on someone, for lack of a better term, uh, and report someone and say they've been out of the province or they were playing symptoms. But other than that, it is self-assessing. So if the person is uh, honest, completely honest about it, and does self-declare, then probably they're going to end up in self-isolation or quarantine. And it's workers who are essential for the movement of people and goods are exempt. Healthy workers involved in the trade of transportation sector or employed in the movement of goods and people by land, air, or sea. Healthy people who have crossed the uh, Nova Scotia border on a regular ongoing basis to travel uh, for work or to carry out their duties. Uh, and it, it, this includes healthcare workers, law enforcement officers, correction workers, infrastructure workers, and also workers who are involved in uh, critical infrastructure in the province. So people traveling to Nova Scotia for essential health services and one accompanying support person. And most times here, uh, an example of this would be uh, paramedics where they're traveling in a vehicle. One medic has to drive and one medic has to take care of the patient. So typically they have a support person with them. Uh, and that would be an example of that type. And then healthy workers employed by medical supply or pharmaceutical companies. Uh, they are also deemed essential and they can travel in another province. In section five, we talk about uh, workers exempt under clause two must practice social distancing. So they're not, they're exempt from, from the 14 day isolation or quarantine, but they're not exempt from anything else. 
So they must practice social distancing and they must, again, closely self-monitor. And it's all about self-monitoring. And if they're uh, honest when they do self-monitor and they uh, have symptoms, uh, then they would end up having to quarantine or self-isolate. All persons presenting, present and residing in Nova Scotia must maintain social distancing in section six of two meters uh, and gatherings of five or less. And we know that now that's been relaxed to 10. Uh, and if the situation changes again, it'll probably go back to five. Uh, but however, as of last week, it's been relaxed to 10. In section seven, social distancing is required for uh, non-for-profit organizations. Section eight, the five person limit for nonprofit organization. And again, that's extended to 10. Uh, five person rule referred to in clause six does not apply to business or organization who can maintain social distancing. So what they're speaking of here is large enough facilities. Uh, we could probably uh, pick any one of the large grocery chains uh, who normally let in more than uh, five or 10 people. Uh, and that's because they've placed dots on their floor and arrows to control the human traffic as they, they go in there and uh, maintain social distancing. So in those instances, they are exempt. <clears throat> in section 10, employers were exempt from the five person rule. And again, that's been changed to 10. 11, exemption for police, fire, EHS and municipal services. So from 12 to 24, I believe, is all about closures. And you can look these up later. In section 25, they talk about the timeline that the order will be in effect, and they've got a provision in there to be able to extend the order, of course. In section 20, uh, in 26, uh, if, of course, we uh, we have to be reminded that the closures now uh, have been relaxed. So employers should visit that website uh, that's on the screen, www.novascotia. Uh, .ca slash coronavirus, and you'll get the most up-to-date information there as to uh, when you can reopen and how, how you should go about it and uh, what restrictions are involved in your reopening. So for employers' uh, responsibilities and due diligence, for essential workplaces or a workplace that's permitted to reopen now, you should develop an emergency pandemic plan and immediately implement recommended preventive strategies of physical distancing, self-reporting, no face touching, frequent hand washing, physical barriers, proper cough etiquette, uh, workplace sanitization and self-isolation and quarantine if you have traffic. That, uh, that would be one of the first steps you would take when you're coming back. Develop a questionnaire for employees to return before returning to work to ensure to determine if there are any symptoms or if there's been close contact of any kind or if the employees have traveled. Then you should develop a procedure on the proper steps to follow if you've identified symptoms, close contact or travel. Complete a hazard assessment of your workplace, determine where the, where, where the hazards exist for con uh, contracting COVID-19. And once you've identified the hazards, you would develop and implement safer procedures to control those hazards. You would develop the pandemic emergency plan, including but not limited to the steps followed, uh, follow in the, to follow in the event of a positive case at your workplace. Uh, that should be part of your plan and you should have a procedure for that. Your plan should also include how to track movement of the positive employee. So that's if you've identified someone as an employee and they've tested positive, you should be able to track where they've been on your work site, who they've been associated with, and, uh, and what they've touched. So you'd want to disinfect and sanitize what they've touched, all the equipment they've touched, the uh, rooms or buildings they've been in. Uh, but the tracking of who they've been with and who they've associated with is to provide back to the medical field for those people who are going to be tracking to see if anyone else has been affected by the, by the uh, virus. So employers uh, who are permitted to reopen, some of the uh, things that we should look at. First of all, how do you work and interact with customers? And some things you might want to consider. Restricting contact between 
uh, through curbside pickup and delivery, for example, changing how supplies are received and delivered, cleaning and disposing of waste more often. Now, these are just a couple of examples. There's lots more, and this is something that you have to uh, discover through your hazard assessment process. And once you've identified all of the hazards, then you would come up with more considerations to try to deal with that. The next one would be physical distancing, of course. You want to uh, uh, make sure that you've got that uh, activated at your workplace. And some of the items there, you could uh, install floor markings uh, to separate and direct customers or clients or, or employees, for that matter. Uh, separate workstations, so example, multi-desk office or uh, in a grocery chain, for example, the cash register lanes. Uh, you could stagger working hours and lunch breaks uh, or breaks and even split up shifts if, uh, if you have the ability to do so. Uh, for cleaning, viruses can live on surfaces for, uh, for days. So uh, some of the items you want to uh, consider here, regularly schedule cleaning and disinfecting throughout the day, frequent disinfecting of high touch surfaces, uh, and for equipment, all of the equipment that everyone shares and uses, you'd want to consider limiting who can use the equipment and schedule to clean that equipment, of course. Any protective equipment required for employees, such as mask, glove, and uh, face protection. Any protective measures uh, to be installed. So in certain uh, atmospheres or in industries, you see the uh, plexiglass the dividers that have been installed or plastic curtains. Uh, so those would be some of the controls you could put in for those. In preparing employees to return to work, we have to be mindful that if employees have not been to work uh, over the last couple of months, uh, they are going to need an update and debrief on what it is that's been going on at the workplace and so that they understand all of the practices and policies and procedures that have been put in place and uh, what they have to do to follow this and to be in compliance with and then, of course, uh, some of the stuff you can do with that is uh, training on how to self-assess for symptoms and what to do if they do have symptoms. Understand uh, duties and responsibilities for both managers and staff and policies to report and address non-compliance. So if an employee wants to see something that wasn't in compliance uh, and it's going to uh, affect and maybe transmit COVID-19, we certainly want them to understand what they have to do with that information. Uh, then we have to prepare our customers or clients or anyone else visiting our sites. Uh, so uh, some of the stuff we want to consider here, signage to uh, limit the number of uh, customers or clients. Uh, and of course the physical distancing signage. Markings for lineups and strategies to reduce opportunities for close contacts. So controlling the traffic flow at exits and accesses or uh, exits and, and entrances. Uh, contact us delivery and pickup that can be arranged as well. So uh, we'd want to monitor and communicate your plan. Uh, everyone needs to be adaptable and considerate as we move forward. This is going to be a different way of doing business. So we want to ensure that our employees, when they return to work, understand this. Uh, and there are lots of times that uh, the patients are probably going to grow very thin. So that's one of the most important parts. And then we want to monitor our plan uh, and uh, edit, audit it to ensure that it's working. And if not, we amend the plan and the procedures. Uh, and it's just a continuing process because the COVID-19 uh, virus and information from the province is uh, evolving every day. And we need to just keep up with it. So there's a lot of uh, editing and amendments that go along with this. So for a non-exhaustive list of common hazards as you uh, tend to reopen, and again, remember this is a non-exhaustive list depending on what industry you're in. There may be many, many different hazards that you're going to be faced with that won't be on this list. So contact with another person, obviously, for work-related tasks. Meeting and training sessions where you cannot maintain the two-meter rule. This has to be looked at and has to be worked around somehow. Lunch breaks and times where you cannot maintain the two-meter rule. And again, we need to uh, look at that. And if we have to separate lunch breaks, split them up, split up the shifts, whatever we have to do. 
touching commonly touched surfaces is a big one and I won't go through the list of the presentation will be available on the uh, chamber's website. Employee displaying symptoms. So we need to understand how to handle that, whether it's a supervisor that finds that out or another employee, it might be someone who has not self reported and someone thinks that they do have symptoms. So you need to be able to address that. And an employee who has traveled out of province. Again, if you have your policy and procedure in place for that, uh, you should be able to handle that quite easily. Uh, uh, here's a different one, more than one person traveling in vehicles. If you have staff that do use vehicles frequently and uh, frequent, frequently have more than one person in the vehicle, then that is something that you're going, going to have to address through a procedure and how to uh, do it safely. And I think uh, Mark Audrey might speak about that a bit more than, than I would. Uh, and again, remember to advise the Josh committee or the rep because again, it's the employee's right to know uh, and their representatives are the committee and the representative. So once we've identified the hazards, we need to get into the controls. And the normal hierarchy of controls in safety is uh, in occupational home safety, it's uh, pretty well always the same. Uh, we do elimination, of course, if we can, that's the safest one. So if we can eliminate uh, the activity or any service or what it is we're doing and delay it until the threat of COVID has passed, that would be preferable. If not, we'd want to substitute. So an example of substitution, if you have someone doing a list of some kind that might take two persons, but one person can do it with a uh, some kind of a lifting device, then that will eliminate the second person, thereby uh, eliminating the risk of transmission of COVID. In engineering controls, uh, we go into physical barriers. So we talked about the plexiglass and the uh, and the plastic uh, drop down curtains that we we are seeing regularly at any business we go into. Uh, redesign of common rooms, so meeting rooms, training rooms, lunch rooms, and whatnot. Uh, are being redesigned and ships are being changed to accommodate that. Control human traffic patterns is a big one for anyone who has a lot of human traffic in an office, building, or shop, or any workplace for that matter. Uh, you want to prevent people gathering in one spot and uh, to, to uh, maintain the two meter distance. Dedicate hand washing facilities, of course, uh, hand and soap is preferable. Uh, water and soap is preferable, and hand sanitizing equipment if you don't have water and soap, would be, uh, we want to have them placed in strategic places throughout the workplace. Increased workplace cleaning frequency, a lot of the places will have to uh, up the uh, ante on cleaning the workplace, uh, so just remember that, and of course, reinforce personal hygiene measures for all of the employees. So in administrative controls, accommodations for staff to work from home is the first one. Uh, a lot of people have been doing that and are encouraged to keep doing that if they're able to do so. Uh, split shifts, again, as I mentioned earlier, eliminate document sharing. If you do have systems where you have to share documents, you should try to convert to electronic, uh, which would make it a one-touch document. Uh, just the person uh, who is uh, doing it on the uh, computer and then sharing it with all others. Uh, and sometimes that's difficult, but for the time frame of COVID-19, uh, what most employees or, or employers are doing is eliminating the requirement for persons to have assigned documents and uh, the sharing of them and keeping the records of the electronic uh, sharing is what they're using to show their due diligence. So reassign high-risk individuals. If you do have high-risk individuals who uh, may have some form of an illness or disease, or uh, maybe are older in age. Uh, so you could reassign them to an area where they may they would not be exposed to COVID. So for personal protective equipment, the last line of defense in the hierarchy of controls, uh, at, at times additional PPE is going to be required to deal with COVID-19. So employees must be trained and used in the use of uh, and maintenance of PPE, of course. Do not share the PPE with anyone. Obviously that's a um, common sense. Proper storage of your PPE once you've uh, used it, the cleaning and the storing of it, and don't allow uh, employees to bring their PPE home. Although some of them may try and may want to do that, uh, you certainly don't want them bringing the virus home. And when physical distancing cannot be achieved, 
some of the PPE that could be included for COVID, uh, respiratory protection. But remember, with respiratory protection, if you're using uh, appropriate respiratory protection as per the CSA standard, uh, you would need to be, uh, the employees would be trained and fit tested to do so. If you're wearing non-medical, then you don't have to worry about the training. Disposable nightgown gloves, of course, coveralls, and of course, safety glasses or uh, shield, uh, depending on what it is that you're doing and how serious the hazard of COVID is. Written safe work practices and procedures. You want to develop these procedures and practices. You want to train and educate all of your staff in those safe work procedures and practices. And if you're going to have a facilitator uh, train or educate the staff, you'd want the facilitator to document who was present, again, promoting that one touch document. Uh, continue monitoring the workplace and modify your safe work practices and procedures as required. Again, this is an evolving uh, thing. It's COVID-19 and things are changing on a daily basis sometimes and other times and weekly. So we're going to have to amend as required as we go. Inform the employees of the changes, of course, if we have to make any. And then complete field inspections or, or uh, uh, audits, just to monitor and ensure that your safe work practices and procedures are working in your plan. And then reporting procedures. If any worker experiences symptom, symptoms or becomes unwell, they should report to their immediate supervisor while at work. Then you should follow the provincial reporting requirements, which can be found in this website that's noted on the screen. Keep the worker isolated from all other workers once you find out that someone has symptoms. Facilitate the completion of the online assessment, and that's, this can be done at 81, the 811 number. And further assessment and direction can be obtained when you call the 811 number. And then you have to worry about how the person will be transported off site. They may want to transport themselves if they have a vehicle, and that would be fine. Uh, but if they don't, then you're going, someone's going to have to make arrangements for that to happen. So, in summary, we want to follow the provincial and the federal recommendations and guidelines. We want to include the Josh Committee in the rep so that everyone on site is aware of what's being done about COVID 19 and if there's any threat of the virus on site. Develop an emergency pandemic plan. Complete a hazard assessment of the workplace to identify COVID-19 hazards and implement controls for those identified hazards. Develop written safe work procedures for those hazards and practices. Train your staff on the implemented controls and safe work practices and procedures. Audit for compliance and edit and amend controls and safe work procedures as required and then advise the staff of those changes. So other considerations that I won't go into but I'll just mention because of the time restraints today. Uh, work refusals, this could become a real thing. It's, uh, it's a right uh, and it's in the act and it's uh, there to protect employees and they certainly have the right to exercise that. Uh, so if they do, you'd want to know how to deal with it. Uh, however, I will say that if you do everything that we've spoken about here and you have all of your due diligence done and you've identified the hazards and you've dealt with them, then there probably won't be a refusal. And if there is, it's probably not going to go very far. Uh, expired training or certification could become an issue during the times of COVID. And if there is uh, what's being said by most training organizations and what the Department of Labor has said, the Occupational Health and Safety Division is that they're asking the training facilities to extend the timeline on the, the previous training as long as it's expired during the time of COVID. Uh, they, they won't accept someone who expired three years ago uh, to extend theirs. But if your training expired in the last uh, three months, uh, then the training facility has the right to be able to extend that training until such time as they can provide the training again. Uh, Will the employer be contacted if, if an employee tests positive? Uh, and what I've been able to gather on that is that if that employee is uh, seen as having been in close contact with someone at your workplace, then 
the workplace will be contacted uh, for the tracking to happen. So in that instance, yes, you would be. But if uh, they haven't been in close contact with anyone at the workplace, you probably would not be contacted. Uh, and what are the WIMIS implications for the cleaning supplies? Uh, and the Global Harmonized System is working on that. And maybe Mark Andre or Mark Andre Lavoie will touch on that uh, to uh, uh, expand and, and broaden uh, what we can do on that. For further information, uh, please refer to or contact any one of these sites. Uh, and as you see, uh, the black text that you see usually is talking about uh, what each site can help you with. So first one, general info, online assessment tool, hand and workplace cleaning, the order itself, the information on carpooling, the mass. So well, Marc-Andre Lavoie, it's your turn to at the mic and um, hopefully we won't, Zoom won't kick us out for your presentation. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, the full presentation, you were basically done. So uh, I just the last run through, I hope you didn't uh, miss anything at the end, but I'm sure we'll catch up on that on uh, at the question and answer period. So uh, the mic is yours, Marc-Andre. Okay. Jeremy, you... Um my, my camera is off and uh, it needs to come from you. Oh, there it is. Thank you. Good job. You're right on it. All right. I'm going to share my screen. I just realized that uh, two minutes ago that I did not have a conclusion. But it's okay. There's no conclusion, maybe, to this topic. All right. So, um, thank you, Susan. Uh, it's a bit... Um, it's a bit uh, difficult to do these types of presentation on, online because sometimes we don't have the, the feedback that we usually have. I've seen that there's only, there's been no question in the Q&A yet. So please um, feel free, feel comfortable to uh, write down your question that uh, helps us uh, focus on the topics that are, uh, that are um, more important to you and get us prepared. We will likely run a little late um, since, uh, so we have, have 15 minutes to make it to the hours and we'd like to keep, uh, to keep some, some, some time for questions. So um, we'll be running a little late. <clears throat> All right, uh, preparing for the new nor normal and I, I call this presentation, let's get ready to dance. And uh, it, might be, uh, it might be a funny uh, presentation, but it comes from, from a presentation that I've seen already. And I, I want to emphasize um, uh, the fact that this, this, this crisis is, is, is serious and it, it, it needs the involvement of everyone to, to look at it. And it, it's very common in uh, occupational health or public health situation where you, you have the scenario, if you do nothing that we have here, the situation could get pretty bad. <clears throat> and then you start doing things and the situation does not really happen. And people tend sometimes to believe that maybe we did too much. Uh, so, and, and it's hard to prove because we didn't see the situation happening. But there, there is example in the history where we did less or there is example in countries where they've done less and we can see the potential that this crisis had. So basically the, what, what we call this is called the hammer and this is basically the, the, the initial order that uh, Don discussed about from the public health director that, that, that mentioned we, we, we have to close down everything. We have to stop, stop seriously our, our number of contacts and try to, to reduce, reduce the, the spread of the virus. But once we have been through this, this first phase, which we're, <clears throat> sorry, which we are pretty much into now, there might be other peaks. They might be going up. We might do the same thing again, or we might use a, strat a different strategy. So as, as we, the, the director of public health pays attention to new cases, he might not come with a second hammer. He might come with a different strategy that are be more linked to targeting uh, clusters, if there's areas or different type of businesses that are more impacted by this, this uh, spread of, of cases. And it might be, uh, it might be uh, quite different. So basically what we're looking for is, is called a business continuous, continuation plan. 
and the business continuation plan should include uh, <clears throat> option preset options for 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 managers and, and the workers to 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 be able to dance the various uh, potential scenarios that are that are coming in front of, in front of us. All right. So, so well, let's get going. Um, I have various uh, presentation, uh, uh, various uh, model of this presentation. So <clears throat> I'll go with what we got for the time that we have ahead. And uh, you see that the set of slides that will, I will get to you will be a, a bit more thorough than what we'll see uh, today. I think the most important thing in these types of issue is, is to discuss about the mindset. And I already touched on it. Is this, is this issue important? Is there a risk? Is this risk important? What should we do about it? Is, is, is a, an expression that I uh, learned from when I was actually working in public health. And I think it uh, greatly applies here. Uh, we're gonna look at uh, a little bit about the technical side, more, more the, the, the how does the virus spread. And by understanding how the virus spreads, it gives you more option in your toolbox about how to prevent that spread. So understanding how it works helps you develop a proper control plan, and that's going to be uh, important. I'm going to talk about various criteria for reopening, and of course, there, there are some things that are that are, that are coming from the public health department, and we're going to look at at those, and we're going to look at different options. Uh, <clears throat> The, the the strategy used in Nova Scotia is is a good strategy. There's a, there's no there's no um, there's no uh, critic of it, but uh, definitely it's slightly different than other things that we've seen, for example, in New Brunswick or in other area of the country or even internationally. And it's it's good to 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 know that uh, Nova Scotia is a bit different, and it's it's interesting what they're doing. And I guess the most important thing is the tools. So, like I mentioned during uh, to Don this morning, the, there's, there's, there's the, the requirements of the regulation, but there's no regulation that predicts every situation. So, how do we go about to using tools that will be recognized by, by the public health director or the public health department as um, demonstrating that, uh, that uh, your, your, your plan is a good plan? And, of course, discussion and q &A. All right, let's get going on this mindset. Uh, there's one important mindset that, that we forget about, and it never been so true. And this is something that I use in, in my presentation, uh, where, <clears throat> where I see, uh, especially large industry, they have been very focused on occupational safety in the last 10, 20 years. They've been slightly less concerned about occupational health. And, and, and in order to, make people understand how important is occupational health, I use this slide. And this slide has never been so true than in the current situation with the COVID-19. So occupational health will lead you to good employees' health, and that's gonna increase your workforce productivity, and that's gonna increase your business performance, and that's how we create strong economy. And this is important in this case, if you look at it, it's like the employees' health here there's a big concern about that. And, and one should, should understand, and it was more true in the, in the first phase where you have essential services that remain open because the, the public health director message was stay home, see as little people as possible, don't make contact. And at the same time, some of the population had to go to work because they were deemed in, in the essential services population. So this is putting these people in a situation that is different than the general public. And you can see the stress that it's making on them. And by making a good plan, that will help those people being able to continue. People don't work very well if they're worried every 10 minutes if they will get sick because they just had a contact with a person or because they feel like the, like, 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 like the area is not being cleaned at, the, at a decent frequency. So you have to look at this. When you're reopening up your business, can you maintain the confidence of the person that when he would stay at home is safe and we don't increase the, we control the risk that is, that is increasing by him going back to work. 
that's going to help you keep work productivity and that's going to help you keep a business performance especially in the service uh, business people will not want to go into uh, shops that uh, that they don't feel safe in so that's a important one <clears throat> We always say also that we've never seen this. This is unusual. There is, there is actually example. There is lots of example. Uh, and, and there is the 1918 pandemic, which was the most significant one that we have in, in, in the last hundred years. And people that analyze this, they do say the same thing that what I just showed. You're gonna have a healthy economy if you have a healthy population. So if you want to keep your business going, if you want to keep the Nova Scotia open, we have to make sure that our people are healthy and that's how we're gonna to succeed together doing this. This uh, graph to the right here, it shows the, the, the three waves. So we talked a lot about waves. We don't know if we're gonna have a second wave or not, but it's, it's predictable. And that's what happened in, in 1918 is that the second wave was way bigger than the initial wave. And there's actually been a third wave. Now we should be able to understand more things right now than we did in 1918, but sometimes it's not, it's not that obvious. So this here that we see here, the reduction in cases, that's where we are right now. And what we want to do is to keep going this, keep this as low as possible and keep this going and then get to the end. All right, so that's our job. As, as, as we are managers trying to reopen the economy. <clears throat> so mindset is this is a serious crisis and we're far from out of it. So we have to remember that we are far from out of it. So I, so I think Don mentioned people that are working at home and, and it's good and it's working at home, maybe they should continue this in this initial phase of reopening and see what happens. People in the workplace should feel as safe as if they had stayed home. I call this the protection continuum. So think about this. You want to, to, to keep the, your workers in this protection continuum and they feel, and they feel safe. Uh, sadly, by choice or not, congratulations to all owner of businesses and, and large industry managers. You are now a public health specialist and that comes with responsibilities. And these responsibilities is to make sure that what you do and when you talk to your worker and when you say, I feel it's gonna be okay, it's because you did everything you can to make sure that they will be okay. So you are a public health specialist right now. Your success in maintaining business continuity, like your own business, is closely linked to your business sector success. So the, the, the best example is the, is the meat factories, and we've seen those cases on, on the news not too long ago, is, is if, if one meat factory doesn't have a proper program and cases develop there, all meat factories become a focus of higher scrutiny. So it's important that you work with your business industry. And this is a key message from Dr. Strange, uh, Strange, sorry, Dr. Strang, he received plans from industry. So everyone should be, whatever type of industry, you should be in contact with your natural industry council or, 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 or groups that are working together. So your industry kind of work on the same basis plan. And that's gonna help you getting the proper information and being solid. And that's why Dr. Strang says, I will not review individual uh, plans, but I will review business related uh, plans. And that's how he's, he's trying to help us. And I think it's a good balance. I, I like this approach. Try to do your research to identify the recognized tool, customize these tools to your personal situation, act, document, follow up on incidents, or if you have identified hotspots. So that's your mindset. So this is not Next Monday, I will put all these things in place and then, then it's over. This is, is about Monday, I would put these things in place and then I'm gonna observe what's going on, I'm gonna pay attention and I'm gonna improve my tools because this could, could last for a long time. So it's not just a patch. Uh, because, uh, and that's the last point, today's reality may be quite different from tomorrow's and 
either way, we could open to 50 people next, uh, in a month or so, or we could go back to where we were. I think it's unlikely that we go back to the hammer phase because we'll be more prepared this time than we were. The, one of the key issue about closing the economy was our level of preparedness and our level of preparedness was not there. So the, 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 the best way to avoid another general closure is to be able to demonstrate that each industry is that we are prepared to face the peaks, the, the, the increase if any of them occur. All right, I'm trying to pay attention to, uh, to, to my timing and uh, I'm already took uh, almost 10, 10 minutes. So I'm gonna have to go quick on this. Uh, key issue to consider, I think I'm gonna show this one because this one is one that I, that I, that I, that I like. Um, all of this to say, you have to, to, to do occupational health. It's, it's a bit different than occupational safety sometimes. Is that safety, most of the time you work on specific cases. Somebody had an accident or there's a risk of this accident. In occupational health, you, you deal more with probability. So basically, we did not eliminate all contacts to, with everyone, but we reduce our numbers of contacts. And by reducing our numbers of contacts, the number of the, 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 the probability of spreading the disease is, is reduced. So we need to keep going on this, keeping the probability of spreading the disease as low as possible. Um, Okay, here we go. So, uh, um, Don already mentioned this, uh, the, the, how the uh, virus spreads. So it comes from people, mostly big droplets that we found when people are coughing. So we can have mouth to end to mouth. And that wash your hands. So that has to do with, with surfaces. So that's why if you touch a contaminated surface, then you touch your mouth, then, then, then the virus might enter your body. It could touch your eyes too, it's the same, same type of thing. A uh, large droplet keeps the, your distance, and we use this to define the, 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 the two meter rules. And if there are aerosols, and that's the other thing that is going on, it's historically uh, for viruses, we've been protecting from large droplets, and now you get to six, six feet. But with this new virus, it seems that it, it, it might be spread through, through smaller droplets, so, so there, there's a concern about, about the distance. All right, here we go. So how do we make the, the probability uh, reduced? The, the things that we need to analyze to make sure that the probability of the spread is reduced to a maximum. And the first thing is to control the source. Control the source, there's a difference between somebody wearing a mask, the risk is low, somebody doesn't wear a mask, and somebody that is actively shouting uh, singing, he's gonna, his, his droplets are gonna be spread further away. So, so these are, this is the first thing that we need to consider. The second one is about uh, the turbulence and the speed of the air. So if, if, if I, I, I cough and there's no ventilation and the air is still, it's gonna drop, the big droplets gonna drop like three to six feet in front of me. If there is a ventilation behind me, like a fan because I'm hot and it's coming through and then I'm coughing, it's gonna, it's gonna go, uh, <clears throat> it's gonna go further. So the, this, this, this might have an, uh, so ventilation is an important thing. And, and the, the simple way to, to, to look at it when you reopen is make sure that your ventilation system work at least per, per its original design. And if, you can, if you can bring more fresh air, it's a good thing. And if you don't have a, like a mechanical system, open more windows, keep the windows open as much as possible, and be conscious about the flow of the air in your room. So it's an important thing to, to, to consider, to look at. The volume of the, of the shared space is important. Of course, if I have two people in a small volume, two people in a larger volume, uh, I reduce the risk and two people outside, the risk is even lower. Uh, time that you share in the space, and, and we did uh, look at it, like I so said, the time factor, the longer that you are in close contact with a person, the higher the risk is that if one of the person was uh, a carrier of the virus would spread it. 
And um, so we talk about this, and this is difficult because uh, Don mentioned things about this. If you cannot respect the two meter, so is it is it every time that you cross path with somebody within two meter that is an issue? You want to reduce that two meter. If for some reason there's a task that you cannot eliminate it, you have to apply uh, a 15 minute rule. Talk about the 15 minute rule. So higher than 15, 15 minutes, the risk is considered high, and then you have to put people on respiratory protection. If it's less than 15 minutes, well, then, then you, you try to eliminate it, but it's, it's, it's less of a hazard. So there, there's this rule here that you can apply on unfrequent tasks, mostly if it's a person that you usually work with. And that's, that's another thing that I'll talk about in a minute. Crowdiness. Two person in a bus, uh, 50 person in a bus. So of course you have to reduce the crowdedness on your work area and consider personal protection if required. I would, uh, for most people, I would strongly advise that you set up your plan that you don't need any personal protection or respirator. And if you do, then you need to do it very carefully. But really you try to, to avoid this. All right, I'm gonna have a time problem. It's already 11 o'clock. Jeremy, you need a, a, any advice on time for me? Hey, Mark, on today. I, I, I wouldn't rush too, too much. I think we, uh, we all got a little bit behind after that glitch. So uh, you can keep going. We're good. Okay, okay, okay. So I have all details uh, about this in the presentation and I have some graphics that I've included that you can see. Now I wanna throw your attention. You might not have, uh, have uh, notice but those that notice and in, in Europe and the World Health Organization suggest a distancing of one meter and the CDC and in North America we've been using two meter I, just to tell you about about this there, there's some uncertainty about this and it's not about being precise or perfect it's about reducing the probability by doing the best you can and then you can discuss and focus on the residual risk and see what, what's happening there. So the bigger droplet close, bit, a bit, a bit uh, smaller droplet uh, a bit further. And now see, we're talking, starting to talk about seven to eight meters and very small particulate weigh more than eight meters, which is about 25 feet. So this is what we, we're concerned about. So why are we concerned about this one more? Because one could say, you know what? I should maybe have a distancing of 25 meters. And there's some discussing about it. We know that the droplets go for about to 25 meters, but the big droplets are the ones that have the highest viral content. So here, the droplets are highly contaminated, if I put it this way. These ones are less contaminated because they're further. But more and more, there might be some things that you see in the future about in certain circumstances to, to, to increase this. And this, these ones here, the best way to control them is through ventilation. Ventilation will not allow. So these ones will drop and they will drop to, to, to the surfaces around the carrier, <coughs> sorry, pretty quickly. As those, they will tend to stand up in the air, and that's the one that, that, that you want to get rid of through ventilation. So, so without scientific proof that it's also a big problem, it's been flagged as a, as a significant problem, and people are, are getting more and more concerned about that one. So you have to think about mask, and you have to think about ventilation. Especially in the summer, if you, if you have an office that don't have air conditioning or, or things of that nature, and people are using floor fan, so you want to make sure that the floor, floor fan is placed in a position that they won't spread the virus to the, the person that is still two meter away, but now I'm, I'm pushing it, so my, my two meter should be four meter if I put the fan. So you have to place the fan in order not to push the air uh, from the fan to the person to another person, right? So you want to avoid this. So that's an important thing to, to consider. All right, so I'll pass on this one, but it's, it's just the, the, the same thing. 
about the best way to look at it is to is to is to have both people but this is more for public public safety but maybe in your businesses you might think about that criteria for um reopening the first the first i heard uh, dr uh, strang talk about this he said we will we will follow the uh, health canada guidelines so these these are the criteria that he used but you have to think about is not making a decision for your special business. It's making a, de a decision about the whole public and the whole population of Nova Scotia. So that's a kind of different criteria, but it's looking for these various things. The transmission is control. The sufficient public health capacity in place to test, trace, and isolate. So this we've been doing much better this we're doing better and the isolation of people i think i think we're doing so so there's there's some models like like in that um korea for example isolation of a case doesn't mean the same thing as us us isolating a, a, of a case the person goes home and over there it goes to a special facilities where it's totally isolated so we don't have the, the same level on this one tracing last i heard of him he he mentioned specifically the support of businesses to to make sure that if you can and if it's feasible to make sure that everyone that gets into your your, your commerce or business if you can have some kind of note of who they are in case there's a there's someone that that is infected and said i've been to that store you are able to track as much as possible everyone that is there. It's not always possible, but please think about it because it's something that is extremely important. So these are the three most important criteria in terms of evaluating the capacity of the province to remain open. Can we test? Can we trace? Can we isolate people? Okay. Uh, there's the, the factor about our healthcare uh, capacity. So this is all about the healthcare cap capacity that exists. So right now, we have reached a level where, where our healthcare facilities is not overwhelmed. So that allows us to open. It's a very important factor. And that's the fear about, about the fall is because we might have a COVID influenza combined at the same time. So it's not really the COVID will go up a little bit, but combined with the other one, we reach the limits of our healthcare facilities. So that's where that's a, a, an, an issue where, where you would consider uh, moving back on the plan. Uh, we have support group for vulner vulnerable groups, communities, and key population to minimize outbreak of risks, uh, and especially the elderly in, in, our, in, our, in this current situation. <coughs> Workplace preventive measures are established to reduce risk. So this is what you are currently doing. So your success on this will facilitate uh, Dr. Strang's uh, decision of keeping the economy open. So it is very important that uh, we don't start seeing very finicky type of plan or plan that are just made to, yes, I did something. It's not about I did something. It's about doing things of quality that is, that is, um, that is, uh, uh, will continue with time and that are, that are sustainable. Uh, avoiding risk of uh, important cases, one of the key factors is when we're going to start traveling again and who's going to start traveling again. And there's some that you can decide not to take your vacation, but there's some that is really related to their business. So we'll see what's going to happen there because uh, that's kind of a fundamental cause of the speed of the, the spread around the world is that we travel so fast everywhere right now. All right, here we go. Um, I'll just go quickly on this. I won't go into the details, but some, some, some approach, uh, especially in the U.S., when we saw in the U.S., they talked about this, is, is using phases. So you have phase zero, significant or uncontrolled transmission. And that was the key point in shutting down is that 
we didn't feel like we had the, the, we had no testing, we had no tracing facility, we didn't know the nature, the spread, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's why we had to, to 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 stop down. So the stopping down, it's not really just about how serious it was. It is also about we don't understand what's coming at us. By shutting down, that gave time to the scientists to develop data and information so that next time we most likely will not have to go back to that level. And then we have phase one, phase two, phase three, and the phase three is when you get to low or totally controlled transmissions. So and when we have cases, we can isolate them, track them down and shut it off. So you see things like, it, it does come back, but you see like China and uh, Korea, they have places where they are close to eliminated the, the, the viruses. So, so we're not we're not there yet. We're we're more we're more in phase one, phase two. Now, Dr. Strang decided not to use a phase like this approach, not to define this. And I kind of understand that because once once you define them like that very strictly, you're you're kind of bound to to what you put on the paper. So he's is getting he's more into an, an approach. No, I pay attention to what's going on, and we open based on on, on on set criteria, but not not like a defined definition. If this happened, this is going to happen. It's more of a combination of factor, and one important combination of factor is how business will perform during the reopening. So 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 you're part of the decision. In terms of control plan, uh, Dan talked about this, and you you probably have seen this before. But that kind of, that's kind of the basic plan that is proposed by Nova Scotia. So we talk about uh, how to work and interact with customer, physical distancing, cleaning the equipment. Like in the construction industry, people use to share tools. You try to avoid this now. Uh, preparing employee return to work, and that's a very important. And, and the, the key point is to is to reassure them that it's a good idea to go back to work because it's going to work better for everybody. Uh, customer client information sheets and things like that, and monitoring and, and communicating to your your plan to um, and and Dan mentioned it how, about. So if you're not a business that's been a mandatory shutdown, you don't have to supply a plan to the government, to the public health department, but you must have a plan in case an inspector comes in. So let's say that for some reason, your fault or not, it's, it's kind of irrelevant, but there's a case that is developing, it, it, there's an employee that, that is uh, infected and it spreads in your, in your workplace for some reason. The inspectors and the tracing people are gonna come back to you and the first thing they're gonna ask you is your plan. And I would highly suggest that you have a plan to supply to them there. Because otherwise, in terms of liability, it, it makes you, it puts you in a, in, a, in a poor position if you don't have a plan. So it's not mandatory to have one, but it's recommended that you have one because if they ask for it, you should have one. Not clear, but uh, that's the way. That's the way it, it, it was explained. My interpretation is you must have one, right? Other things to consider that are that I've not really clearly seen in in what was proposed here is a discussion about ventilation, elevators. Uh, of course, you don't know. elevators, work, travel, screening, active tracing. Self-declaration of illnesses. Uh, clearly, uh, th th this is a self-declaration. It's the best way to do it. Uh, Dr. Strang commented on, uh, you know, like a, taking the temperature of people and he advice against it. There's more chance that you, you will flag people that are not sick than you will actually flag people that are sick. Uh, schedule arrangement. Try to do small teams. Uh, you know, it's like it's like going from your bubble at, 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 in your family and going back to work, you should think about it. So you kind of increase your bubble with your colleagues at work. And if you have 20 employees, if you can keep them into smaller team, uh, move their shift around and have like a bubble of five, it's better because if you do have a case, you just have five to deal with. If you didn't manage this, then you have a bigger problem. So that's a good thing to continue. Uh, 
uh, continuous identification, and I call them hotspots, uh, hotspots identification. So that, that's the places, the places where physical distancing or the places or the moment where physical distancing are, are difficult. And you should have a list of those and you should have those and okay, let's try to find a solution on this and keep it going, all right? Okay, uh, uh, still looking for advice from Jeremy. I will show you a few more things because this is important. And then all of this will be in the presentation and I, I will let you look into it, all right? First one, this is a perfect example is, you know what? Look in the t literatures, there's tools everywhere. There, there is general tools and there's business specific tools. For example, I am still upset about the, 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 the physical barrier that are at my, my uh, grocery store. They are not made properly and they don't stop contact. And these cashier are at high risk because the physical distancing has not been made properly. And you might think that I'm just, just there's been two cases at that place. Like I see it, I've contacted them, I have no answer because it doesn't make sense what they're doing. And the, like the cashier nowadays are often, are often people that are retired, like end of career type of, of job. So the, the, the average age of the cashier that was at, at, at my grocery store was close to 60. Now they're close to 20 because some of them got sick, some of them walked away. I don't know the full details, but I can tell you that the average cashier now is 20 years old. So there's been an issue and it's, I'm, I'm not comfortable. And I was coming home and I decided, okay, well, what can we do? I don't like this. Well, let's try to find a solution. And I start making some drawings. The next day, here the Institute of Research on Occupational Health of Quebec, here IRSST, I came up with a design. And see, the issue was that they only put a window here, right? You have to protect the side because here, the cashier passes the bag, fills up the bag, passes to the person. The person is about three feet away all the time, every day for these people. So that, there's concern. So that, there's design there. The other example is the meat and poultry industry. And there is, there is a clear guideline. So that's how they used to, to work, side by side, elbow to elbow, and face to face. So I have less than six feet face to face, less than six feet here. So you can do solution is to cut one side and just do it to the other side. You can have a barrier to separate them here, or here you have a partition between the guys and you have a partition across. And that's what happened. Again, this, they opened up under the, the, uh, the assumption that it was essential business and they didn't do the proper, the proper verification of the controls that were in place and the, the case went skyrocketing. And not only in the workplace, but also into the, the towns that were around it. So that was a big impact and uh, that one was a little bit frustrating. And I'll finish with this one. This is, uh, I got the link here, Back to Work Safety from the American Industrial Hygiene Association. It's called Back to Work Safely. And you have all kinds of detailed guidelines that help you build, build your, build your, uh, your um, uh, business continuity plan. So they're very thorough, very well done. And uh, I, I really do enjoy uh, these ones. And they, they've been helpful. They're a bit detailed. It's, it's kind of a text you need to read but uh, everything's there. The best tool that I've, that I've seen is WorkSafe New Brunswick. And because in there you have <clears throat> a check sheet. So this is a plan. So in, New, in, in, in Nova Scotia, the public health department didn't tell you how to do your plan. It kind of tells you what must be in it, but it doesn't tell you how. <clears throat> this one is more complete. And it's got two things that are interesting. So. Uh, you can have details about your implementation and your status. So you might say, I'm going to do this, but you might not be ready. So you might have action. So that comes into an action plan too. And you have quick links to a guidance on various things. So guidance on physical distance, distancing. You click on that, that, that front, it takes you to a website and gives you some information about it. The, the hand washing uh, poster, for example, and things like that. 
So there's all kinds of, of these things and I'll, I'll keep it like that for now. All right. So I think we, uh, we might, uh, if, we, if we consider an extra half an hour, we have 10 minutes left for questions. Thank you. Jeremy. Thank you very much, Mark Andre. Thank you. Perfect. That was great. We had, I think going over was important. <laughs> Definitely uh, gives some more information and hopefully answers some more questions for people. Um, do people have any questions from the uh, presentation for the presenters? We've got a quiet bunch here today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about you, Jeremy and Susan? Uh, Someone just sent me a thing. So we do have a question from uh, uh, Shelley Bennett Triffis of uh, Triffis uh, Design in Sydney. Uh, yes, both presentations will be uh, shared. Uh, we'll uh, turn them into PDFs and make sure that they're posted and available. And we do have a question uh, from uh, Bodledag First Nation. Uh, do employers need an emergency pandemic plan? Don? Mark, you want to take that one? Uh, I, 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 yeah, I would say that uh, businesses needs an emergency response uh, uh, plan. I think I think it's a good idea to upgrade them to include the pandemic. That's that's what I would say. If you don't have an emergency response plan, and so you don't you don't you don't build one just for the pandemic. If you have one, you upgrade one. If you felt you didn't need one before, uh, and, and unless there's any uh, regulatory obligation, I'm not sure if everyone is have to have one. Don, what do you have on that? Uh, well, my take on that would be uh, one second here to fix my screen. Okay, uh, my take on that would be for an employer to build in their due diligence, they should have a plan. Uh, as Mark mentioned earlier, uh, if something does happen and there's a breakout at your workplace, somebody's going to come knocking on your door, and the first thing they're going to ask for is documentation, uh, and the plan or, or procedures and policies are going to be part of that and training of your employees. Uh, now, uh, Jeremy, I believe you mentioned that was Pontotec. And Bolodec, yeah. Yeah, so that would be federal legislation and, and regulation rather than provincial, I'm assuming. Uh, so you may want to check with uh, the feds and see what they would be looking for from you. But I don't think it would be far separated from what you would be looking for provincially. Uh, so yes, it would be a very smart idea to uh, develop a plan. Uh, and your safe work procedures, train your employees, and have everything in order to ensure your due diligence is uh, is done. Thank you, Tahira. Yeah. We also yeah, have a question. I, I, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Mark Andre. Well, I would just like uh, I would concentrate on, on on building the business continuity plan um, from from like the New Brunswick model or something like that. And in there, there'll be notion about emergency uh, response and what you should do. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to share those links. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very helpful. Uh, we have uh, two questions uh, from Gordon Kerr. Uh, can operators be tested on a regular basis to ensure they have not, uh, that they do not have the virus? Yes, it, it, it is not a, a practice that is recommended uh, right now. Uh, <clears throat> I think some, some some business that did it, so some business did it in the first phase, like large uh, um, uh, industries, and there's been there's been problem. The problem is that the, the test takes a certain time before you get the result, so it's not helpful at blocking your gate. So you, by the time you get the result, it hasn't been helpful. And there's been some uh, serological tests, like test, testing the blood of people. It's a bit invasive from the get-go, and the false the false positive are too high. So you're gonna you're gonna keep people out that are that that should not be kept out. So there's a problem about the false negative, <coughs> and the false negative and false positive. 
it would work if we would have like a, a large spread. So it, it, it's about prevalence. It, tests don't work the same way if you have just a few cases and you try to, to find them, that if you have large, a large number of cases and you try to find them. Because when you have a large number, then you can say, I don't care about having a bit too much because I want to get them all. When you have a little bit, it, it doesn't work good. And it would definitely not be recommended by the public health. So Gordon does have a clarification where he says, what if you provide sailboat tours and you cannot maintain six feet of social distancing? Is there any issue there? Yes, I, I think uh, th this is a, the, a, a special case. Uh, so I am not sure exactly. I have to think about it because I'm a sailor and uh, the, the racing season is going to start in the next few weeks. Uh, uh, I, I, I am not sure. We could, we could maybe take this aside and, and I could look into, but uh, it's a complicated because maintaining distancing won't be possible. The basic is, is if, if it's an afternoon thing, you could have the, everybody on, on face masks. But if it's a if it's a multiple day trip, it's not going to work. No. So so that that one is a good one. But uh, again, you you must have a plan that that you feel comfortable with the, with the customer. It's a complicated one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Shannon McNamara is asking, um, could you touch base on traveling in vehicles? She believes Don had uh, touched on it earlier, and I know um, even uh, there was when golf courses first opened, they talked about plexiglass between the players, you know, like, so do you know of any um, information on that? Yes, there is, in, there is information on that. And uh, Shannon, if you want to touch base with me, uh, I'll, uh, I'll leave you to, uh, I'll, I'll send that information to you. Uh, and in the meantime, I know that there are some businesses out there that are advertising some dividers that Susan just mentioned. Uh, and there's all kinds of things you can do. Uh, and as Mark mentioned earlier, when, when you get down to the last straw that there's anything else you can do, uh, respiratory protection would be your last line of defense. But uh, at times, uh, people do have to use that for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I did just send uh, Shannon the details on how to reach you, Don. And we can put the links at the uh, end of the presentation as well. Um, the you had commented in your presentation about proper disposal of PPE. Don, do you have any uh, information on that? Uh, what I've what I've read on the what the problems is released that is that uh, it uh, gets properly disposed in plastic bags and sealed and then disposed with regular garbage. But Mark may have something other than what I've read there. Uh, that would be more in Mark's ballpark. Yeah, I would have to uh, look at the uh, at the specific, but uh, I, I think what I've seen is uh, you, you have to, to to do your your garbage more frequently. Mm. But it's more it's more in the health, like in the health field, for example, where they have like a uh, hundred disposable per day, right? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so you have to be uh, more careful. About yeah, about it. So. for sure. Uh, earlier, there were uh, comments made from both uh, Mark on today and Don um, regarding available PPE and, and uh, things that you might be able to get. Um, I did post in the chat there a link to um, locations all over the island and even a little bit on the mainland as well where you can uh, receive or uh, purchase various uh, types of PPE, face masks, uh, glass barriers, cleaning services, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I will uh, repost it as well. And Susan, I think we have another question in the Q&A. Well, that's my question given the work. Uh, I'm getting thank, thank yous and <laughs> which one is it, Jeremy, you're seeing? I think Tara McNeil, I think, in the Q&A. Oh, sorry, I'm going in the chat. Uh, do the presenters have any thoughts and research on protecting staff and public in the public library setting? Again, uh, oh, go ahead, Mark. Sorry. No, well, I, I, I would, uh, I don't think I have anything uh, specific on library, but uh, I would, I would review it. It's kind, it's kind of close to uh, retail, right? 
So I would look at the general office setting from AIHA and retails guidelines and then adjust that to your, to your situation. We have uh, created a link on our website and uh, I shared it. Uh, it's um, restarting your business. So it has a link to uh, the Canadian uh, Center for Occupational Health and Safety and they have a few guidelines for uh, starting uh, your business or you know, continuing to operate your business and it's sector based. So uh, maybe one of those would be helpful. And like you said, that New Brunswick um, plan as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and to add to that, uh, so I mentioned earlier, you, when you complete your hazard assessment, every building is different and uh, the layout of it is different. So you have to take into consideration that the traffic, the, the human traffic is going to be in there, uh, how many en exits and entrances you have, if you can control coming in one entrance, exiting through another, uh, and maintaining that physical distancing. That's the important part. Uh, so that's all things that you have to consider when you're doing your, your uh, Safe work procedure once you've begun, once you've uh, identified the hazards, but you definitely have to share the hazards. Yeah, sure. I, I, I would, I would add like, a, like Dr. Strang said, uh, like he, he said, uh, I, I don't have a, a textbook to give you. No. <laughs> so there's certain guidelines. So what you need to do is to find the closest through CCOSH, AIHA, CDC. You you find the closest to what your business is. And then you become a public health expert, and yeah. you have to make 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 some 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 good judgment, and that that's the way you're gonna get through it. So, mm -hmm. so the, the 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 library, I would think about: are we gonna are you gonna limit the number of people in there, or are you gonna leave the door open? Uh, are you gonna highly recognize to use the scanning for 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 the book? And what are the common areas? So all the all the common area needs to be cleaned more frequently. So you need a cleaning team. And you might want to have a plexiglass for 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 the direct services or a distancing one of, one of the two things like that. There is a question in the chat from Gordon on uh, what countries and provinces might have access to Nova Scotia for the summer, and I think it's a bit of a complicated answer. But I think the main answer is just about anyone could potentially have access to Nova Scotia. Um, however, if you mean whether or not certain areas have been given specific permission, like a, a maritime bubble, I don't think there has been any announcement uh, that allows that yet. Um, however, um, people are able to access Nova Scotia via air and sea and uh, car and all that other stuff. Um, I do know that there are certain uh, uh, measures put in place at the border in New Brunswick to uh, um, where some people have exemptions to drive through and others don't and all this other kind of stuff. But uh, the long and the short of it is just about anybody, but there are lots of recommendations in terms of self-isolations and everything. Um, Don or Mark andre do you have anything to add to that on access from outside Nova Scotia? Well, I, I do expect some clarification from public health in, in, in days two weeks now it's not going to take a month but they're going to take a, a position and done done so so uh self-isolating if you come into nova scotia is is still in in, in the active guideline isn't it or is that the it, move it, it is it's still in the active guideline yeah. however there are essential workers uh that are considered essential that can get exemptions so they have to apply for them once they've applied and they've been provided they still have to deal with border crossing and at that time uh, if border crossing uh, personnel accept whatever uh, documentation they have with them then they're permitted to travel without quarantining or isolating uh, that may change but right now it, that's the way it works yeah it's good so are there any further questions that you have anybody and thank you to everyone for uh, sticking with us through uh, glitches. This, this is a little longer than we would normally go, but uh, lots of great info. And just to pass on to Mark andre and Don, um, there are lots of thanks coming to Susan and I through the chat and, uh, and everything from people uh, very thankful for getting the information. Yeah, and we will share it, uh, the Cape Breton Partnership and the Chamber will share it on our social media and our YouTube channel so that uh, the link will be available. And for anybody that did register, um, the link will go to them as well. So uh, I think that'll be good for follow-up because I know tomorrow is the day that we open. So uh, the, yeah. uh, they're busy getting things ready as well. So uh, 
they might not have had the time to uh, join us today, but um, I'm sure there'll be a lot to follow up. So thank you so much for your time, uh, Don, Mark, and Jeremy for facilitating, helping us out in the back end. I thought I lost my internet. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was Zoom. We'll blame it on the Zoom. It wasn't it's, me. It's yeah. So thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. Nice meeting you, uh, Marc Andre. Uh, Pleasure. Thank you again, Don, for your time and your uh, work that you put into your presentations. Yeah, well, thank you guys and Mark. Nice uh, talking with you there, and we'll see you some okay. other time down the line. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. Take care. Yeah. Thanks, Jeremy.